Romans chapter 2. I hope you have a Bible with you. Romans chapter 2. More trouble for the self-righteous. Of course, I wasn't here uh, last week. Sue and I were in, at a missions conference in Florida. But the week before, we talked about uh, that there is uh, problems. The self-righteous have tremendous judgment coming on them. And today we see, as we continue here in chapter 2, more trouble. Now, Paul is building an argument, you might say. Actually, it's God's argument. We know that. But showing that uh, um, uh, society has basically fallen apart. The world has fallen apart. Humanity has fallen apart. By the way, that's why the world and society has fallen apart, because humanity has fallen apart. And that apart from the Lord, there is no hope. And so we are, we are building towards that conclusion. Uh, Romans, while it's not, a, it's not a legalistic book, it is one that is a, uh, I can't help but be impressed by the logic of it in, in, in the sense of a, a, almost like a, a legal document, the way it is put together. The truths are laid out so clearly and the arguments are made so clearly here. More trouble for the self-righteous. Now, let's begin by saying something very true, and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, move on. But Because even though the truth we're, I'm about to mention is true, we've got a problem in our nation and because um, we fail in it. Let me explain this to you. No country has deeper roots in the Bible than the United States of America. Okay, you might say, what about Israel? Just the Old Testament, not the New. Okay, uh, the, the nation of Israel, Jews in general, re reject the New Testament as the Word of God. Uh, we embrace all of the Bible. We believe all of it is, is, is the Word of God from Genesis through Revelation. So no country has greater and deeper roots in the Bible than the United States. Our entire system of government is based on biblical principles. That is why we have not only survived, but thrived as long as we have as a nation. This is why we've been blessed so greatly in the past as a nation. And of course, the rejection of that is why we are suffering the way we are today because of the rejection of the Word of God. According to the publication, World Religious News, April 5th, 2017, yeah, they, they, uh, they took a poll. I'm not sure how they did it, but I wouldn't doubt that it's accurate. They said this, the Bible is in 87% of American households. Okay? Now, I didn't say all of them are fundamental Bible-believing Christians. I said the Bible is in 87% of American households. That's almost nine out of every ten homes has the Bible in it. But because we have the Bible in our homes, and to some extent are familiar with what it says, that doesn't change the fact that you and I are still sinners who disobey the Word of God, and we are deeply in need of a Savior, right? To have a Bible is great. To believe it is even greater, okay? And so lots of people have a Bible, Okay, there's, there's all kinds of trouble today, even within Christian homes, even among Christian families. These are people who are raised with the Word of God, and yet their lives are in shambles. Well, what's going on? Well, we are sinners, and we are in need of a Savior. Now, the passage we're looking at today speaks to those who are religious but lost. Particularly, it's speaking to the Jews of the day. All right, now before, hopefully no one in this church is anti-Semitic, all right? The Jewish people are God's chosen people. They're still God's chosen people. He's about to start dealing with them more directly again, all right? And um, uh, the church has not replaced Israel, okay? Don't, don't fall for that stuff. They're, they're separate, Okay, there's the Jew, there's the Gentile. For those who trust Jesus Christ the Savior, you become then part of the church, the body of Christ, which is made up of Jew and Gentile. Ephesians chapter 3 talks about the mystery. The mystery is not that, that Gentiles would be saved. The mystery is that Jew and Gentile would end up making one body. That was the mystery according to Ephesians chapter 3. 
But this is dealing specifically, uh, particularly with the Jews today, although there's great application for us. Now in chapter 2, Paul has begun the long argument that proves that all men are sinners and stand guilty before God. Let me say today, you are a sinner, okay? You are a sinner, but guess what? So am I. Every person who's ever lived with the exception of Jesus Christ is a sinner. And if a sinner, we need a Savior if we're going to make it to heaven. No one in themselves is, is a righteous person in God's eyes. Righteousness, according to God, is his standard of righteousness. To get into heaven, you actually have to have, according to Scripture, the very righteousness of God himself. Okay? Now, you know what? That excludes you and me until we put our faith in Jesus Christ the Savior. We, we, we like to measure ourselves by each other, and, and, and Romans 2 deals a lot with that, okay? Self-righteousness. We like to compare. But here's the truth of it. Until you are perfect and you are as righteous as God, there's no comparison whatsoever because we're all still guilty. We're all still guilty. And so what do we see first? Well, in, in kind of picking up where we left off last time, verses 14 through 16, we see the condemnation of the Gentiles. Now, how many of you are actually Jewish today? You're here, you're Jewish. Raise your hand. Any Jewish people in here today? Okay, you know what that means? That means we don't, by the way, for the record, those of you who aren't here or watching, um, we have no Jews here today. What that means is the rest of us are Gentiles, okay? Gentiles. So we're all Gentiles. So w what is the word to us? Well, the, the word to us, isn't this great? The first thing to us today is that we're all condemned. <laughs> Verses 14 through 16, it says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, the law referring to, now remember when Paul is writing this, the Gentile nations, they were not familiar with the Jewish law, all right? They were going by their own gods, their own standards, and so forth. However, however, look what it says. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law, God's law, written in their hearts, how? Their conscience, bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to, Paul says, according to my gospel. In other words, it was the message of salvation that he was preaching. And so I want you to notice two things under this. The first is this. The Lord has instilled his moral law into man's conscience. We see that in verses 14 through 15. Man is accountable. I love to, uh, I love to when I talk to atheists and share the gospel with them, you know, they love to come up with the thing as, well, I don't believe in God. I just believe in, I believe in just treating people in a fair way, in a good way, in a kind way, and I don't need God to do that. And by the way, uh, I think it was Jeff sent me an article just yesterday. Was that yesterday, Jeff? Uh, about the uh, world famous Richard Dawkins, atheist, okay? And he basically was saying, oh, don't do away with religion because basically what that does is that, that kind of uh, keeps, keeps the moral lid on society. Hello? What morals are you referring to, sir? You see, folks, he's painting himself into a corner as time goes on. Have you noticed that about Richard Dawkins? He's painting himself into a corner on this. Leah, here's the truth of it. Keep pressing an atheist when you talk to him. Be very kind to atheists, okay? And by the way, atheism is a, is a disingenuous position because there is nobody in the world who can prove there is no God. They have no evidence that there is no God. There's lots of evidence that there is a God. All you got to do is look. It's there. But here's the thing. They'll say this, and I've, I've shared the gospel with lots of them and argued with them, and they'll say, well, I don't need God. I don't need God to, to live a good life, to be kind to people, to have an enjoyable life. I don't, I don't need 
God. Well, well let me ask you this. You say, uh, you know, we can just treat each, everybody in a good way. Good in, in the sense of what? Well, be kind to people. Be loving to people. Have respect for people. Treat them in a nice way. Do good things. And here's what I say. Where did you get those qualities? Where'd you get those? Well, uh, uh, no, 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 where'd you get those? What's the origin of them? Well, they were, <laughs> here's what they say. I've heard this, I don't know how many times. Okay, they must have a, a, a manual or something that they use. <laughs> here's what they say. Well, these are things that society has decided. Okay? No, friend. These are things that God has ordained and he put them in us with a sense of right and wrong. Now, I know there are whole societies and peoples today who, you know, from an early, early age, they are immoral and they do this to each other and all that, and that's contrary to the way of God. But that's not the way God wired us, okay? That's not the way he wired us. There is a, there is a conscience in us, and he has written the law of God in our hearts. So he has instilled his moral law into man's conscience. The atheists, they talk about living moral lives and treating each other in a humane and good way, but where'd they get the standard? That standard is the Word of God. It's where we got those standards from, okay? Now, even the hardcore atheist, here's the truth of it. I was going to say the nasty little secret. It's not nasty. It's wonderful, actually. Here's the truth of it, okay? Every one of them, regardless of how they may lambast God, every one of them wants to be treated in a Christian way. Every one of them. Every person on the planet wants to be treated in a Christian way. Why? Because it's ways of love, kindness, understanding, Okay, encouragement. These are God's qualities. These are God's qualities. Compassion. But secondly, under this, the gospel is the standard of judgment because it holds up the righteousness of God as the standard for what is needed to enter heaven. Now, where do I get that? Well, we see that in verse 16. God is going to judge the secrets of men, the, the things that man is holding in, by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. What is Paul's gospel? Well, hold your place and go to chapter 1. Chapter 1. He clearly defines it. And again, the standard of righteousness is not man's righteousness. The standard of righteousness is God's own righteousness. So here's the issue, friend. If you believe you can be good enough to get to heaven, let me ask you this. Do you think you can be as good as God? I think most people would say, well, no, I can't be as good as God. You're right, but here's the problem. That's what God requires. If you're going to get in, and, and we saw that by the time last time, okay? Our, by, the, by the way, we saw that last time where, okay, if you could earn your way, fine. But if you're going to earn your way, you've got to be perfect from the day you're born to the day you die in thought, word, and deed. Guess what? We're all guilty, we all fail, we don't qualify. Therefore, if we're going to get into heaven, it's got to be by a source outside of ourselves. Romans 1.16, Paul's gospel, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And by the way, the word gospel means good news. It's simply referring to that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried, he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Notice the next phrase, to everyone that believeth, not doeth, not worketh, not is faithful, not is committed, not is a good person. No, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We usually stop there, but go to verse 17. For therein... In the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by what? By faith. By faith. Now listen carefully, friend. Here's a, here's a class today on instant discernment. God wants us to be discerning. Okay? 
Some people say, well, you know what? I, I don't know if what they're saying, if that's a false gospel or a true gospel. Easy, easy, easy. Here's how you discern what is the true gospel, what is the false gospel. Whose righteousness is the basis on getting to heaven? If it has to do even a little bit with man being faithful, that's man's righteousness. Ah, false gospel. Well, you need to believe in ah, false gospel. Believing is the only way you can be saved. Believing is how you get the righteousness of God. It's God's righteousness. As soon as you say, I have to be faithful, I have to do, I have to stop, I have to start, you now are taking the responsibility of getting yourself to heaven by your righteous deeds. That will not save anybody. That's why the, the uh, common or the popular message today of what we call lordship salvation or loadship salvation or discipleship salvation, where it's not only the grace of God, but also my faithfulness that's going to get me to heaven. That's why that is a false gospel, because that's saying it's the righteousness of God and the righteousness of man. No. Man's guilty, lost, condemned, hopeless. That's why Jesus came, is to be the payment for our sin, because we can't pay for our own outside of spending forever separated from God and Jesus died in our place, paid our sin debt in full, okay? This is you and me, and my wallet represents our sin. We are sinners. If we die with our sin, we'll be lost forever in hell, lost forever, no second chances. Heaven is a perfect place. I have to be perfect to get in. I am not, therefore I am guilty and condemned. That's why no matter what amount of good works I add to my life, it doesn't take away the sin. The sin has to be gone. So then what am I going to do? I can't do anything of myself. That's why God sent us a Savior. This hand representing the Lord Jesus Christ. Sinless Son of God. And when Jesus went to the cross, all of our sin, past, present, and future, he took it. He took it all upon himself. He paid the debt that we owe. He rose from the grave victoriously to prove it was done. And he says, if you believe that he did that for you, the moment you put your faith in him, he gives you everlasting life. He gives you his own righteousness. Hey, if you're as righteous as God, you can certainly be in heaven. All right? And there, by the, that, by the way, they're the only ones who are, those who have his righteousness. No human righteousness is in heaven because Isaiah says all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in his sight. It's a message of grace. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we see in verses 14 through 16 the condemnation of the Gentiles, those who don't even know the Mosaic law, and yet they have a sense of right and wrong. Where did they get that? God wrote it in them. He put it in them. Okay? But secondly, we see the condemnation of the Jews, verses 17 through 29. It says in verse 17, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the law, and makest thy boast of God, because the Jews are God's chosen people. And so, you know, they thought, hey, we are, we are the ones, we're the elite, you might say, of the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's very common for, then, for Jews to call Gentiles dogs. All right. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, because they know the word, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Hey, listen, you've been entrusted with the perfect standard of the word of God, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, <laughs> a light of them which are in darkness, and by the way, this was the responsibility of the Jew towards the nation, nations. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth of the law. Now you notice there was the mindset of the Jews at the time. Uh, here's, here's how they saw themselves compared to Gentiles. 
They say, you know what? We know the law. God gave us the law. I didn't give you Gentiles the law. He gave us the law. And, and, and you know, we are, we'll, we'll, we'll instruct you. We're a guide of the blind. We're a light of those of you who are in darkness. You're foolish, but we'll instruct you. You're like babies, but we're teachers of babes. Okay? which has the form of knowledge and of the truth of the law. You see, here's the point. God is saying this. What arrogance there is of not only the Jews, but also other religious people of our day. Folks, you see it all the time. People who think, th- who think they are righteous because of what they do. Okay? Here we are, and we can we say, you know what? I'm just a lost, guilty sinner. I am so glad God saved me by his grace. It's just, it's just all of what Jesus did. It's nothing of what I do. Oh, no, you're one of those people who believes in that easy believism stuff. Let me tell you something. You're not going to heaven. After, the Bible, after, after all, the Bible says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Hey, haven't you read the rest of those verses? The fact is that passage in Matthew 7 condemns the very ones who use it that way. Because that passage talks about they are the people saying that. They're the ones trusting in their works to get in. And Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. It's just the opposite of the way people use that passage. Here's the point, folks. You can't do anything to save yourself. No amount of faithfulness, commitment, sacrifice, reformation can get you into heaven. And because the Jews were somewhat smug about them being God's special people and having the word of God, they figured, well, we'll give the the nations a break and we'll let them know what the truth of God is. But read on. See, read on in, in the text. See, there they were, and many people are today, proud of their religiosity and, and accomplishments. Now, listen, I love Catholics. I love Catholics. I was raised Catholic. I was raised Catholic. Matter of fact, I was named after a Catholic priest. God has a sense of humor. <laughs> and I can tell you that Catholics are taught that they are right and the rest of the world is wrong, okay? And that they, they are the ones who are the holders of truth and everybody else is wrong. That's the way you're taught as a Catholic, okay? The Pope is infallible and, and the church is, goes all the way back. They say, it's not accurate, but they say it goes all the way back to Peter. They'll say Peter was the first Pope and on and on. By the way, that is completely made up. And if he was the first pope, we're all in trouble because Jesus said to him, get thee behind me, Satan. Anyway, here's the point. Many believe in their hearts that their good works, that's what I was raised believing, good works, gift to charities, etc., will gain them entrance into heaven. We live in St. Cloud, very, very Catholic community, not totally, but very Catholic. And again, I love Catholic people, okay, and I, 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 appreciate, uh, I appreciate people who, who believe in, in living in a right way. That's a good thing. But friend, if you're trusting in that to get you to heaven, that's a terrible thing. And here's a lot of people, not only in St. Cloud, but all over the world, and by the way, not just in Catholicism, but in all the man-made religions, they're thinking, you know what? I will give this enormous sum of money in my will to this cause. Or, you know what? I've got these millions, and I'm going to give them millions. I'm going to give millions to this. And, and, and in their back of their mind, they're thinking, certainly this should help me get into heaven. Okay. And you can even talk to some, and they'll say, do you think that's going to get you into heaven? And they'll say this with a smile on their face, well, it can't hurt. Really? The truth of it is, friend, that can hurt you forever. Because if your faith is in your good deeds, gifts, kindness, good works. You have a false savior. You are your own savior 
which according to the Bible is no Savior. You need the righteousness of God, not your own, which is not going to get there. Now, as we have already seen in chapter 2, verse 1, those who judge others are guilty of the same sins. Revel, uh, not Revelation, Romans 2.21, Thou therefore which teachest another. He's, again, he's, he's kind of, okay, okay, you Jews, this is what you believe, and I'll just exp it, I'll expand this today. Okay, you self-righteous people, you religious people, this is what you believe. Because they'll say, well, you need to do good works. Well, how many good works? Well, you need, to, you need to do good works. You need to turn from your sins. How many? Well, you, a lot. Have you turned from all your sins? Well, no, but this is what you need to do. You need to keep, keep the Ten Commandments. Okay, let me ask you this. Can you give me the Ten Commandments? Well, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't kick a dog. Don't kick a cat. Um, <laughs> cleanliness is next to godliness. Um, by the way, most of those are not commandments. <laughs> and you get red face, and then they'll maybe fold their arms and say, well, who do you think you are? You can't tell me that you go to heaven, it's a gift. Well, that's what God says. Why is it a gift? It's a gift because we can't earn it. It's a gift because we could never pay the price. That's why Jesus came. Thou therefore that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? You teach others, but you don't follow what you teach. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, does thou steal? By the way, the answer to that is yes, you do. Oh no, not me, I've never stolen anything. Well, let me ask you this, what about cheating? Have you ever cheated? Fess up. Sure you have. No, 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 I've never cheated. Never? In your life? In any way? Have you ever loafed at work? And not worked 100% of the time, diligently? Well, then you've cheated. Because you didn't do what you're getting paid to do. That's cheating from your employer. What about, have you ever gossiped? Before, Have you ever lied before? Well, yeah, just the little white ones. Well, friend, person who believes in telling white lies soon goes colorblind. Listen, there's no such thing as a white lie. All lying is the same, and it's all wrong according to God. What about idolatry? Oh, no, I don't have any idols in my yard. Yeah, but you know what? An idol is anything you put before God. Have you ever done that in your life? Well, oh, okay, let me ask you this. Have you ever done something else than worship the Lord with your life? Well, what about you? Oh, I admit, I've broken all these. But my faith is in Christ. It's not in me. Because I know I am condemned in myself. What about taking credit for something that's not your idea? Is that not stealing? What about plagiarism? College kids. What about plagiarism? It's a lot easier to just cut and paste from somebody else and call it your own. That's stealing. Give credit. Verse 22. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery... Does thou commit adultery? Oh, no, I've never committed adultery. Let me ask you this. Have you ever looked at another woman and lusted? Or have you, ladies, have you ever looked at a man and lusted? That's, that's adultery if you're married. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 5. Does thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, does thou commit sacri sacrilege? You're against idols, but yet we don't. Worship the Lord as we should. You see, they, the Jews, were not true to their sacrifices to the Lord. What do I mean by that? The record of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, was that they were giving the Lord less than their best, and God rebukes them. That's stealing from God. It's sacrilegious, and it's hypocritical. 
What do you mean by hypocritical? Let me define hypocrisy. What is a hypocrite? Well, that's someone who complains that there is too much wickedness and violence on their DVD player. One of the famous hypocrites of history was a guy by the name of Jesse James. Jesse James killed a fellow in a bank robbery and shortly thereafter was baptized in a Kearney Baptist church. Then he killed another man, a bank cashier, and joined the church choir and taught him singing. He liked Sundays, Jesse did, but he couldn't always show up at church. On two Sundays, he robbed trains. We wonder why people get turned off. Verse 23, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. Okay, which leads us to our third point. The hypocrisy of the Jews and their self-righteousness made the Gentiles doubt the validity of the word of God. And folks, nothing has changed. And even those of us who are born again save people. When we do not live out the word of God, the onlookers, the skeptics, they look, and yes, they've got their own sin. I get that, and I understand we're not perfect, but they look at us, and they're looking. That person claims to be a Christian, and by the way, in their mind, they have a higher standard than many of us do in the way we live, and if they see our lives filled with hypocrisy, they say, I don't want any part of that. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. And this is the same today as it is uh, today with the lost. Verse 25, for circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. Of course, circumcision was something associated with the Jewish people. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. You you, you might as well have never had it uh, done and you being identified with, with uh, Judaism and, and the Lord God, if you break the law, what good is that if you break the law? You see, a Jew who breaks God's law stands guilty before God in the same way as a lost Gentile stands guilty before God. That's what God is trying to get us to understand here. The Mosaic law was and is impossible to keep perfectly because we all still sin, all right? Verse 26, therefore, if the uncircumcision, Gentiles, keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? In other words, he's a better Jew than a Jew. But this is hypothetical because the Gentiles don't do it either. Of course, Gentiles don't really keep the law, verse 27, and shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and the, and the circumcision does transgress the law. Okay? So a, a Gentile who keeps the law has more human righteousness than a Jew who doesn't keep the law. Now again, the standard is God's righteousness, not ours. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Notice, it says in verse 29, in the spirit. What's God getting at? I believe he's saying this, folks. What there needs to be is there needs to be a new birth. Because Gentiles violate their conscience. They violate right principles. Why? They're sinners. Jews violate the law that was given to them. Why do they violate the law that was given to them? Because they're sinners. And so the Gentiles are lost because they're sinners. The Jews are lost because they're sinners. Well, that pretty much covers it. So all humanity is lost 
because they're sinners. So you know what we need? We don't need reformation because it doesn't work. We've been trying that. What we need is salvation. We need a new birth, a new birth. John 1.12 says, but, but as many as received him, talking about Jesus Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God or the children of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We need a new birth. You can't earn your way to heaven. Look up here. Look up here. Let me, let me illustrate this. Okay? We covered this Wednesday night. We cover it regularly because most people don't understand it. Everybody is born, if this arm represents our natural birth, everybody is born you're a natural man, according to the Bible, or a woman, okay? Everybody is born this way. We are born with a sin nature. We are sinners. This is why we violate these things. Even if you know right and wrong, we sin. We go against it. We violate it. We rebel, okay? That's the work of the flesh. That's the work of the old sin nature. Now, here's what religion does, and this doesn't work. Religion says, oh, you know what? Um, I know the righteous. I know, what, I know the difference between right and wrong. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to give money or go to synagogue. I'm going to give money. I'm going to be a good citizen. And by the way, those things may be good in themselves. And by doing that, I'll just keep cleaning it up and fixing it and, and, and so forth. You know, it's sort of like a, sort of like a pig. You take a pig, you say, oh, man, what a mess. He's been in the pig pen. I mean, he's, he's, he's you know, he's, he's dirty and crummy and he's, ugh, he's, he's a mess and he's got this scuff and he's got slop all over his mouth. You know what? He needs some ref. We need to clean him up. We'll clean him up. So you take him and you hose him down and you, you, you scrub him and you get him nice and you, you know, you get a little cologne, maybe our piggy number five or something like that or... <laughs> You put a put a put a, a a bow in his tail or whatever, and and there he is. He's ju he's just perfect. Now there you go, you know, be warmed and filled or whatever. Um, what's he gonna do? Right back into the pig pen. Why? It's his nature. It's his nature. You know, you can try to clean up the old man all you want. He can't get into heaven. He's flawed. He's flawed. Heaven's a perfect place. Friend, you know what we need? We need a new birth. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Savior, Jesus said in John chapter 3, you are born again. Born again. Oh, yes, Christians still have a sin nature. Listen, this is why we still sin, because we have a sin nature. But now we have a new nature, okay? This new nature is born of God, according to 1 John 3. It cannot sin. It's perfect. God wants us to learn how to live according to the new nature and forget about the old nature. When the temptations of this come up, we turn to the Lord, we yield to him, we obey his word, and we exercise this new man. Now, listen, here's what happens when a Christian dies. He's qualified for heaven because he has the righteousness of God in his new nature. And when a Christian dies, this is what he leaves behind. And you go to heaven on this. But when a lost man dies, he can't get to heaven. He doesn't have a new nature. And he dies, and he goes to hell. You need a new birth. You need a new birth. By the way, this is why Christians still can and do sin. Okay? All the wickedness of this old nature is still there. And you can do those same things. Yes, you can. I know some people may argue that, but you're wrong, friend. You can do it. It hasn't changed. The sin nature hasn't changed. God's given us a new birth, though. He wants us to live according to the new man. All right? And this is the key of all of this. And by the way, this is why salvation is by grace. Because no, what, no matter what you do to the old man, you cannot merit it. You cannot clean it up enough. You can't reform it enough to make it fit for heaven. You need a new birth, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. We need a new birth. And when you die as a Christian, you leave your old nature behind. Hallelujah, by the way. 
and we go to be with the Lord because we've been born again. Look up here, over here. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, up there too. Look what it says. For by grace are you saved. Boy, I love that word. Unmerited. Undeserved. When you understand there's nothing you can do to save yourself, you become a candidate for the grace of God. Because you understand, you know what? I'm helpless. I'm hopelessly lost. The only hope I have is what Jesus did for me on the cross. Yes, that's where God wants you to be. For by grace, God's unmerited favor and kindness are you saved through faith. That's all. Faith. And that, look at it, it's not of yourselves. You're not saved of yourselves. It is, salvation is the gift of God. The gift of God. Look at the next phrase. Not of works. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. Every religious person in the world is trusting in their works to some extent to get them to heaven and it will not save. The only way we can be saved is by grace, not works. Grace. It is God's unmerited favor towards us and he gives it to us as a gift. Salvation is a gift. It's open to you today if you'll receive it. Okay? Friend, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you trust in him today as your Savior, as your payment for sin. And when you do, he will give you the gift of everlasting life. Would you do it? Let's all bow in prayer, shall we? Today, as we close, please, with every head bowed and every eye closed, now, we're not going to embarrass you in any way, friend. I'm not going to have you stand up or come up front here. But would you decide right now to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? I, have, I, I, I can't help but believe there are people in this room today who've never really understood this until today. Hopefully you've understood it. I don't know for sure. But friend, God is offering you heaven. It's a gift. You can have it. Will you right now put your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior? God will give you everlasting life. Will you trust him as your Savior today? Put your faith in Christ that he died for your sins and rose from the grave. When you trust in him, all your sins are forgiven. You cannot go to hell once you've trusted in Christ. He's given you a home in heaven as a guarantee and he'll never take it away. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has, hath right now, everlasting life. Will you trust Christ today as your Savior? Would you do that? In quietness of your mind, you cannot make a mistake. The Lord knows what you're thinking. Get it settled with him. Get it settled. Now, if this made, if you, you've never understood it until today, and if this made sense to you today, and today you trusted Christ the Savior, could I pray for you as we close? I won't embarrass you in any way. I'm just going to ask you to slip up your hand. Now, raising your hand doesn't save you. It just lets me know that it made sense to you today, that today you trusted Christ. I want to pray for you, friend. Could I do that? I won't embarrass you. But is there anyone who would say, God bless you, dear friend. I see your hand. Pray for me. Today I trusted Christ as my Savior. Is there anyone else? Pray for me. Today I'm trusting Christ, him alone, to get me to heaven. Is there anyone else? Pray for me. Today I got it. Today I trusted Christ. I'd like prayer. Anyone else? Father, we thank you for this one who indicated that they understood today and they trusted Christ as Savior. I pray that you would bless them, that you would guide them, that they would understand once they trust Christ, they become a child of God. And now, Father, you would like them to start growing as a newborn baby. And that's through learning the Word of God and and, uh, and, and getting exposed to it and applying it to life. So I pray they keep coming out to church and keep learning the scriptures and growing spiritually and how you're going to work in such a marvelous way in the life of one who does. For the rest of us, Father, I also pray that we will continue on. We rejoice, Father, with all who come to faith in Christ. And uh, we thank you for your word today, how clear and powerful it is. We know, Father, it's all by grace. It's the only way we can be saved, and we thank you for that. Bless each one. We pray, Father, all could come back tonight and be encouraged as believers to continue on 
as we should, and to stand up for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for all your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.